Well, normally when we start these events, we have to sound a car horn to get everybody to quiet down, but I, I sense that the room is ready to hear what these gentlemen next to me have to say. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Steven Zoff. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford, the CARS program. Uh, this is, in fact, our 19th Open Garage talk. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us tonight for this talk, uh, Designing to the Limits. I have a, a couple of quick comments to make, and then I will uh, get out of the way for the main attraction here. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a fireside chat format, so uh, our guest tonight will be engaging in a, a, sh a short dialogue here on stage. Uh, towards the end of that, we'll uh, do a passed microphone for questions, so if you have things that you'd like to ask, uh, wave at one of us, uh, the car staff, and we'll bring a microphone to you so that your question can be heard. Uh, one of the key elements of the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford is about sharing knowledge with a broad community. And I can really think of no uh, better way to do this than talking about a truly accessible textbook uh, that members, members of our community have uh, chosen uh, to write to share their knowledge with the broader community. So uh, with that in mind, uh, there is an opportunity to buy the textbook. So Harry from the Stanford Bookstore is back at a table with a red tablecloth over there. Uh, and if you're lucky, uh, maybe you'll get some of our guests tonight to sign the, the textbook that they wrote together. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce our guests. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to welcome Michael Kochendorfer, Professor Michael Kochendorfer of the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, also one of the co-directors of CARS. Michael, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, together with him, Tim Wheeler, uh, a former student uh, who defended his thesis uh, just over a year ago and is now a software engineer at Kitty Hawk. And uh, engaging them in conversation tonight will be Sebastian Thrun, who is uh, one of the early faculty members of CARS, in fact, uh, founded CARS together with Chris Gerties and Cliff Nass uh, more than 10 years ago, and since then has founded uh, Udacity, uh, Kitty Hawk, Google X, uh, and probably a few other companies that I haven't heard of yet. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. All right. So as part of this class, we had a competition, and actually the TA of that class, uh, John Cox, I think is here, and uh, Tim won hand. that competition. There he yeah. is. Uh, Tim won, uh, won that competition, and, uh, and I later invited him to be my PhD student. And uh, this has resulted in, uh, well, outside of the collaboration, raising my family, my favorite collaboration of all time, uh, writing this book together with Tim. Yeah, so how do you pick Tim? Why Tim? <laughs> I have picked him too. So, yeah, yeah, it's a good choice. So uh, Tim's attention to detail is unparalleled. Uh, his mastery of, of the concepts. Um, he seems to tolerate... Uh, uh, <coughs> <laughs> Me. Uh, and Anybody in the audience feels the same way? <laughs> and I, I knew that the, the, this, this is a topic that I care very, very deeply about. And I, um, and I, I knew that I needed to uh, be able to trust the, the, the co-author to, uh, to create this book and he made it so much more awesome than I ever could have anticipated. So how many years did it take? Uh, Two and a half years between the uh, first get commit and then the book. That's insane. That's wrong. Yeah. That makes me embarrassed. <laughs> the, then, <laughs> wow. <laughs> it took me six years to write mine. <laughs> so immediately following the, fall, the, the last commit, we started our, our first commit of our next book which is uh -huh. going to be even more awesome, really and it's well. titled uh, Algorithms for Decision Making. And it's going to come out in a year, half, year and a half from now? <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say, Tim, um, you guys did something really mean. I mean, I looked at the book, I, I went and flipped through it, I started reading it. I think this is going to be the last book ever written on optimization. Don't mm. you feel bad about it? I think it's great. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully it's, it's like the first book that people will see in an optimization. Well, one of the re reasons why we adopted uh, the Tufty style with the larger uh, uh, side margins for references is so that uh, it would introduce non-experts to the vast literature on optimization. I mean, few things are more fundamental than optimization in engineering. 
But it's also really fundamental in pretty much every other field. Like when you think about physics or chemistry or economics or statistics or whatever, uh, uh, optimization is, is very much fundamental. And there are lots of really great books uh, out there. And hopefully this will help uh, put those into context. I mean, this is all Stanford PhD students or similar. Um, I recommend check it out. It's actually really beautifully written. It has very crisp algorithms, which I love. I hope they're all debunked. Uh, crisp math, crisp diagrams, and has a really nice way of blending the, the, the great vision of things and the, uh, with the details that you need to, to apply those methods. I think it's an amazing book. This is probably more optimization than I've seen in my entire academic life. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of debugging, actually, all of the code is executable. So it's implemented in Julia, right. uh, you know, uh, humankind's approximation of the divine language. <laughs> and um, and uh, it gets executed to make those figures. So, so coming, there coming in, I was else. thinking, why, why not Python? Why Julia? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> or MATLAB or So, well, like in Python, you'd have to rely on something like NumPy. So okay. If you want to do matrix multiplication. But NumPy works. Yeah, it works. Don't go after my NumPy. <laughs> Julius, uh, so can you use sigma as a symbol in Python? Oh, my God. Right. Any, right. any take us for that question? <laughs> So, so it's it's both very readable and it's also very fast. And we weren't we were designing to optimize for understandability than than for speed. Uh, but it's I, I I think it's actually very readable. For my first book on decision making under uncertainty, I used uh, pseudocode, which mm -hmm. is pr pretty readable but not executable. Yeah, I give you that, and that, that way it's debugged. For my book, I used pseudocode and didn't debug it, which turned out to give us 50,000 <laughs> pages of errata. Um, after, after you do this, I mean, as a professor, say you can go the way of building lots of research papers or write with a textbook, and uh, it's a deliberate choice. Does writing a textbook change your perspective on research? Ooh, uh, good question. Um, so, so go, go for it, Tim. Um, Part of writing this textbook is not just finding all of the research papers and optimization and writing them out in a condensed form. Um, it's actually a lot of uh, principal component analysis. So what we're doing is we're looking at the, the, the space of optimization. And we're trying to find the simplest principal components in each kind of area. So we don't we don't take like the fanciest new research algorithm. We say like, okay, what is gradient descent? What are different flavors of that? But not just like the three combination flavors, but like the different single variations that you can make, and we'll talk about those. So for instance, in the real world, if you do single variable optimization, you're going to use Brent's method. But Brent's method is not in the book. Brent's method is a combination of multiple different things. But we talk about those multiple different things, and in that way you can look at it, you can understand it by itself, and then you as an engineer know when and why to use it, and then you can combine what you need in your real problem. So when you go and read it, and uh stumbled across fitting Gaussian processes or lower confidence bound exploration and think about that's complicated. And it's actually simple. Okay. It's simple. Right. And so where that ties into research is you, you have your research problem and you're trying to solve something very specific. And then you can pull out the little tools from your toolbox, which are these principal optimization algorithms, and you can combine them the right way. Um, that works in the industry too. So my, my background is in, I, I was actually a Stanford undergrad. Here. I, I did uh, computer science, bachelor's and master's, and then uh, a PhD in informatics. And the extent to which I was exposed to optimization in general was pretty limited. Like, I knew what stochastic gradient descent was, and I, I know I, I learned about um, simulated annealing. But beyond that, you know, and uh, when I joined the aerospace department, I learned about all of these different kinds of techniques that they've been using uh, for the past couple decades uh, uh, for optimizing wing design and aircraft design and so forth. And it opened up a, a whole new world to me. And uh, I've been trying to bring a lot of those insights from other fields into what we're doing in reinforcement learning and so forth. That's very, very cool. So you are a, a third generation pilot, I hear? Or do you fly? Uh, I haven't flown recently, um, and books. but but my daughter there is thirteen, and she'll be starting her flight training sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs>
Can you confirm? <laughs> uh, well, good. So I started when when I was 15, and that terrified my mom. But my dad ran a flight school, and I would uh, say, in the interest <laughs> of humanity, please don't fly too often. <laughs> um, tell me, um, Stanford is a great university, and we have many world class departments. Air Astro being no exception. What's the cultural kind of feeling between computer science where you live and, and air astrosis? Anything interesting for people to harvest here? So just to clarify, if my department chair is watching this, I, I am situated firmly in the aero department. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm courtesy in computer science. And I, I came here from MIT, and one of the things that really uh, excited me about Stanford is, is the lack of disciplinary uh, and departmental boundaries. Um, and it has been really exciting uh, bridging the, the two departments as, as well as uh, some of the other departments. So what do you advise, I mean, as many students here, say a computer science student or an ARS student, what is your advice to them how to navigate Stanford? In, in terms of the disciplines? Departments, disciplines, what is there to learn? You obviously learn a lot of continuous math in the era a lot of discrete math in computer science. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think the, the primary advice that, that I give my PhD students is look at the intersection between two different communities that, that are very different. And uh, that's that can be really hard because they often use very different notations and so forth. But identifying those bridges and, and uh, situating your uh, research in, in that area leads to really cool insights. Tim, you, um, you, with a book like this, you're ready for your tenure track. <laughs> but you chose neither, neither track nor tenure. Well, Michael went astray. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What happened to you? Uh, <laughs> well, my CEO. Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just learned you're secretly writing a book. <laughs> so, uh, it's still on the table, but um, I spent a lot of time doing uh, very interesting research, but I wanted to see. Uh, my work apply to something in the real world. Um, it's very different uh, writing writing code and writing research papers that uh, basically end up being published at a conference versus writing code at a desk and then flying a flyer that changes based on what I wrote. So tell people what you do. All right. <laughs> uh, I work at a company called Kitty Hawk uh, down in Mountain View. Uh, Sebastian is my CEO. Um, and I work on the flyer vehicle. I write controller code that uh, keeps the vehicle flying uh, fast and safe. Okay, so any graduates who are looking for jobs, T H R U N at Stanford.edu. All right, so um, what's your next book? Uh, the next book is uh, Algorithms for Decision Making. Yes, so uh, Michael has a previous textbook, Decision Making Under Uncertainty, which covers uh, MDPs, MDPs, decision making theory. Um, and we are going to take that and revamp it in the new style. Let me provoke it. So that's for the fun of it. Okay, so let's see. Put this off without insulting you. Um, so the last four or five years have seen this massive explosion of, of computers in the news, and it's usually about machine learning. It's not about optimization. Does this bug you? Ooh. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have some thoughts on that. Go for it. Machine learning. Yeah, I'm friend, I'm friend, I'm friend, I'm okay, we're among friends. Okay, we're friends. And uh, so, really, machine learning is just a special type of optimization, right? Yeah. You're just optimizing parameters of some kind of representation. Maybe it's a neural network or whatever, but... We have this, we have backpropagation in here, I found it, and it has this bizarre name, I forgot what the name was. So... The forward backward thingy? Uh, so, so... <laughs> so, um, you guys must remember backpropagation this. is really just a, a way of doing, calculating gradients, Correct. right? And but you have, a, you have a section in there where you can pick on, on calculate forward path to differential equations. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so, so there, there are different ways to do it. automatic differentiation. And a neural network is a type of computational graph. But it turns out that you can calculate gradients of uh, computer programs. And if you code it in Julia, it's actually really easy to compute these gradients without relying upon uh, other libraries or yeah, re reverse accumulation, code. right? Is the name? Yeah. But forward and reverse mode accumulation for. So if David Ramelhart only and Jeff Hitton only had Julia and your book, they could have. That's right. Yeah. as a footnote. <laughs> well, <laughs> so so this goes back to the principal components. So yeah, deep learning, you you calculate the gradients, and then that's not the end of it, right? That's just one part. And that's right. either forward or reverse accumulation, and then when you apply the update, you're doing some descent method. 
and there are a bunch of them and they're in the book, but they're not like deep learning is the union of these things. It's not. Is, is anybody working on deep learning here? Can you raise your hand? Okay. Oh, no, really? No way. What? Seriously, no way. <laughs> no, no, raise your hand, not your foot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see some okay, of my good, students good. here. Come on. All right. <laughs> so, so what we tried to do in this textbook is like it, remove, cut away all of the hype, all of the buzzwords and so forth, and just really focus on, on the core principle ideas. Right. And a, a lot of the hype you hear is just really the combination of a few of these principle components. So, so what, as a, as a machine learning person, what, what chapter should I start with? Is the the, the first one is really nice. It gives a <laughs> historical <laughs> overview of it. the field of optimization. Well, it's about so. but, 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 well, well, yeah. I mean, understanding and appreciating, yeah, Gauss and Newton. I, I mean, a lot of the principles that underlie modern machine learning actually trace their roots back to Newton and okay. before. Yeah. Turn, turn <laughs> tables here a little bit directions. Um, Erastro, um, a field actually interesting sample that was uh, created by Bob Ken a long time ago, and I think went through a generation shift recently, is my understanding. Yeah, um, there, there are newer faculty now. That, that's true. Um, and there's also, um, I'd say the funding has changed significantly from, from the military. Um, mm -hmm. What do you see happening in the field? Is the field going to be, become super hot? Is, is it going to change the world? Is it going to be uh, trickling along? And we have this, this incredible dichotomy between like super smart web students and the SAA. Um, yeah, good, where, great where question. So I, I think the field of aeronautics and astronautics has really seen an explosion. You, I mean, you've been part of it. Um, uh, it's it's different from what it was before. So AeroAstro historically has been, you know, probably about three different subdisciplines. You know, structures, fluids, and controls and dynamics. Plane, helicopters, and rockets. Oh, yeah, so those are application <laughs> right. domains. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> those, yeah. <It's> <laughs> uh, so, uh, a, a major new area is autonomy, and that has really captured the excitement of the, the newer generation. In fact, we just started the undergraduate program in aeronautics and astronautics here at Stanford um, just over the past year or so. Uh, we had our first graduating class uh, this past June. And uh, it, it was fueled actually quite a bit by student demand, uh, undergraduates in particular. We have the Student Space Initiative, which, which is a, a major driving force in, in our department, as well as the Stanford UAV Club. And I, I, I think with the new excitement with urban air mobility systems, um, this will draw more people in, into the department. Cool. So but one, one thing about Aero. Uh, is, is that it's, it's a combination of a number of different disciplines. And that, that we don't have a systems engineering department at yeah, Stanford. It's, it's aeronautics, astronomy, and astrology, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to make it more fun no. for the audience. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no astrology, no astronomy. <laughs> but that, that's actually what most people think I do. <laughs> <laughs> Who here is a PhD student? Okay, uh, more. more. Okay. Um, who's underway? Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah. Um, so you see now the world from both sides. You've, you've, you've won undergrad, PhD student. You actually finished your thesis. Congratulations. That's actually a big accomplishment. Um, and then you've worked at least for a year in industry. When you look at your younger self, what advice would you give yourself where you are today? <laughs> so, uh, uh, one thing that I am very thankful for is that I was able to uh, try different research labs before committing to a professor. So I definitely recommend going to a bunch of different professors and seeing what the different research projects actually are uh, before committing to one. Um, actually, I got pretty lucky. Uh, I ended up with Michael, uh, but I, the first person I went to was not actually Michael. Uh, and I was really close to joining, but then that professor told me, like, no, I'm not going to let you join until you, you try at least one other lab. Mm. So cast yeah. gradient descent. <laughs> <laughs> so well, that must have been a difference. mistake, a major mistake. <laughs> <laughs> what was your thesis on? Uh, my thesis was on uh, validation for autonomous driving. So given the fact that Waymo cars are driving millions of miles every day in the real world, um, and the amount of the number of fatalities for humans is thankfully actually really low per mile driven. You'd have to drive like a billion miles or more in order to show that a car is conclusively safe. 
And as soon as you change something, you got to start over. Uh, so how can we find techniques that let us do some of this faster, maybe in simulation, maybe with uh, uh, focusing on corner cases and uh, those sorts of things. So I did a lot of uh, prediction of human behavior, simulating humans, uh, simulating sensors, and then putting it all together uh, with critical situations. Cool, cool. I wish you could do the same for flying cars now. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Once, uh, once we have traffic, <laughs> it's good. I think at some point I'm, I'm opening up for the audience here because I'm sure you have more interesting questions uh, than I have. But I want to uh, go back to the science of your book a little bit and think about what's next. What are the, the big for you guys the big open questions in optimization today? I mean, you cover discrete, you cover continuous, you cover algorithms and systems, you cover design methodologies. Um, I'm sure there's no single algorithm that, that cures it all unless if the world is convex. Um, what are the big open questions? So, so one thing I see popping up is a lot of the uh, a lot of the optimization problems in the book are fairly uh, fairly fixed. So you know, like, okay, I've got ten parameters, and I need to figure out what the solution is where I just change these ten parameters. Uh, but there's a whole class of optimization that is not limited to that. And so, uh, for instance, if I'm doing deep learning and I'm trying to not just optimize my neural network, but figure out what the structure of my neural network is. That's a lot harder because suddenly it's not just like ten numbers that I change, or even a million numbers that are like I know. It's like, oh, okay, do I like pass this thing into there, and do I change the structure over here? Do I have like a big tree, a small tree? So optimization over these structures, or it's uh, expression optimization, I think is a big a big deal that people are starting to take very seriously. Michael. Uh, so uh, actually, I went to a really fascinating Qualls presentation in Double E uh, uh, this morning with. Uh, uh, and uh, Stephen Boyd uh, on convex uh, formulations for training neural networks. So uh, we've seen a ton of success in, in a number of domains ranging from natural language processing to computer vision where stochastic gradient descent seems to work pretty well for training these deep neural networks. But we don't have a really good understanding as to why it works. Um, the landscape is non-convex, -con so which means that you can get stuck in these local minima. Uh, but there, there's a, a really interesting branch of research looking at convex relaxations for training these neural networks. Interesting. Uh, I would assume when the weights are small, the neural network is convex. You know, the weights get larger here, the non-convexity is correct. Right. That, that, that's right. So. Yeah. Um, let's, I think, I mean, this is going to be otherwise a, a super boring thing because I, I run out of jokes here. But <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's open it up. Do you have a microphone for the audience? Okay, first question, right here. What are your favorite algorithms in life? Oh, yes, Alex. Oh, thanks, Alex. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. So, um, I, I'm curious to know your Mine favorite. Is Twiddle. Uh, Twiddle? Yeah. Okay. Pattern search is. Twiddle in the book. I have a four-line version of it, like if every grad student. Uh, now that the book is here, I make them read the book first and then do that. Yeah, so so look under pattern search. Pattern search. Uh, yeah, well, okay. Okay, so so twiddle, <laughs> twiddle is I start here, then I go a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there. So you do a small delta in each direction. You pick the one that improves it the most, go that direction. If nothing improves it, you shrink. Really simple, you can write it in like four lines. Um, it's it's an search. improvement over what's known as graduate student search, where you <laughs> optimize one hyperparameter exactly. at a time, and the stopping condition is the NeurIPS deadline. That's, that's <laughs> actually an improvement over undergrad search, where you make <laughs> undergrads do all the work for you when they come back with a solution, right? Okay, that can fun. actually work quite effectively. Uh, but my favorite uh, optimization <laughs> is, uh, well, it's, it's the simplest. It's also four lines effectively, but it's the cross-entropy method. So here's the, here's the idea. Uh, so you, you, you sample your, your search space. You fit a distribution on the elite samples, so the top 10% or, or so. You fit a distribution. Maybe it's a Gaussian distribution, or it could be a multimodal distribution or whatever. And then you sample from that fit distribution to the, um, to the elite samples, and you just repeat that process. So like basically four lines of Julia, maybe more for some other languages. Um, and then uh, it actually works quite well in, in practice. So those are, those are very good, good optimization techniques. Uh, my actual favorite 
uh, besides pattern search is uh, anything with Gaussian processes. I oh, think they're yeah. they're very efficient. And That's very more beautiful. than four lines. That is more than four lines. But you could be surprised how small you can make it. How do you explain to Lehman Gaussian processes? Uh, Gaussian processes are distributions over functions. So basically, <laughs> if I'm trying to optimize Raise something, your hand, you with him. <laughs> if I'm trying to optimize something in some space that I don't know, and I have a few points, a Gaussian process will kind of estimate that space, what it looks like in between the points, and then you can use that to pick where to sample next, where you have the most uncertainty coupled with the best chance of getting a better sample. Okay, that's a good answer. It's the best I've heard so far. There's a <laughs> microphone back there. Yes. Um, both of you said that teaching optimization was really important and really broadly applicable, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on when that topic might be taught earlier in one's education and what sort of push would we need in order to get that into earlier curriculums? Earlier meaning um, K-12 or undergrads? Either, either. Kindergarten? That, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really great question. So there is this really great program here at Stanford. It's part of the Stanford Office of Science Outreach. And um, when I first got to Stanford, I signed up to host a, uh, a series of high school teachers uh, from the Bay Area. And the first few teachers I hired uh, worked on making an optimization curriculum for K through 12. What were the so, examples? Uh, so w what were the training examples? What, 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 what problems would they give the kids to, to understand optimization? Uh, so most of it was just single dimension, just an abstract uh, uh, formulation, but we related it to aircraft systems, optimizing uh, airfoils and, and so forth. Wow. High school students air doing airfoils? That sounds dangerous. <laughs> what, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but all of, all of that material has been posted online. Um, the uh, there are PowerPoint presentations that, that teachers can use just out of the box in their classrooms. That's very good. Do you have the slides for this published as well? Uh, there are slides available. I went into the link website. this morning uh, that is in here. That, that seems not to be working. The MIT press link? Tim notified them this morning uh, that their link was down and they will rectify it. Fantastic. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but right. there, there are teaching materials and exams and so forth. So uh, cool. professors at other universities can adopt this as a textbook. It's a great textbook. Yes. So my question has to do with the insights you gained from working with all these techniques. If you look at the natural world, whether you look at trees and how they differentiate and how they figure out or what processes determine the spacing of leaves or the way they grow, or you talked about your twiddle algorithm, which is the way effectively bacteria search for gradients and nutrients when they swim in solution. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, have you thought about the larger, more complex bio biology in the world we actually live in with the insight you're getting from these algorithms to understand a little bit how nature works? That's a that's a great question. So we have a chapter dedicated on to population methods, and a number of the population methods are bio-inspired. Uh, so uh, the, there's a type of approach known as genetic algorithms, where you represent uh, your design as genetic material, and then you evaluate a population of random individuals, and you um, the, the fitter individuals uh, propagate their genes more frequently, and there are also mutations and so forth uh, as well. Um, th but that's one of many different um, bio-inspired optimization algorithms that, that are out there. We, we, for the purpose of this book, we were focused on taking, in that particular chapter, taking inspiration from nature uh, to inform engineering design. But of course, nature is a great engineer as, as well. And um, there, there have been some efforts to look at how these optimization algorithms can inform our understanding of biology. Want to add to this? Or? That's a tough one. Uh, so I think a lot of times, uh, either from 
from the academic or industry perspective, the problems that you want to solve, you have a lot of background knowledge in. Uh, and whenever you have that background knowledge, you can leverage it in order to get a more efficient solution. Um, so whereas a lot of these very, very large complex systems, they can't rely on that background knowledge, or that background knowledge has to kind of be discovered in the same way. So as engineers, we come from this other perspective kind of naturally, which is why all of these algorithms exist in the first place. Um, Humanity is starting to work on bigger problems, like with, with the advent of deep learning and everything, and so maybe we need to start taking inspiration from some of those other uh, techniques or applying things like stochastic descent to greater to greater magnitude. But it's a good good insight. Hi. <clears throat> uh, I'm wondering uh, when you think, uh, when it's necessary to be globally optimal or when we might be uh, satisfied with a, like a local minimum or a feasible solution. That's, that's a great question. So uh, one of my application areas is to aircraft collision avoidance. And uh, with these aircraft systems, you really care about making people really safe and you, know, you don't want planes to crash and you also don't want uh, the system to be alerting all the time and uh, being inefficient. Uh, the, the reality, though, is that um, for many of these problems, you a, a really good solution is just fine. Um, uh, you don't have to be. You don't have to prove that you're exactly optimal. And in fact, for many really interesting problems, you can't because the landscape is non-convex. But there are also a lot of really interesting problems that if you can create a, a convex formulation of the problem, you can prove that it's exactly optimal. And it feels good in your heart to know that you have uh, created the, the best possible design. But at the same time, your formulation of the problem might have a bunch of parameters, right? Like, uh, like in your objectives or in the way you're modeling the problem. So there's uncertainty actually in the construction of that optimization uh, formulation. And you aren't going to have anything optimal in the real world anyway because all models are wrong and some are useful. Let me dive into that specific one because it's very practically important. So you build a model, you, you, you might even be God-given gracious to have an optimal solution, mm -hmm. and then you go out and want to apply it. Uh, what's the science of understanding to what extent the model is correct and understand how sensitive you are in optimization approach to possible flaws in the model? That's great. Uh, that's, that's a really great question. So uh, in, in my work on aircraft collision avoidance, we frame it as a very, very special and exciting type of problem formulation known as the Partially Observable Markov Decision Process, or PomDP, which actually Sebastian uh, led the, the revolution in uh, in the late 90s. Um, so Dates me. <laughs> I mean, the, the idea goes back, uh, you know, back to the I did 60s, not amend that. actually. Um, uh, Actually, one of the early theses was done in the double E department in, I think, 1962 on, on POM DPs. No, here at Stanford. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, what, we, what we were worried about, as part of our formulation, we needed to model the pilot response delay and strength to the advisories being generated by this aircraft collision avoidance system. And we... We didn't really have a great model off the bat. And so we just made something up that uh, had a probability distribution over the response times. What we did was we assumed that model, we found the, the solution to it, and then we evaluated it on a bunch of different um, instances that had very different ranges of pilot response models. And we found that there, so long as you had a reasonable probability distribution over the pilot model, uh, the end behavior was actually pretty good and acceptable. So um, sensitivity analysis. Speaking about that, since I, I'm an aspiring pilot myself, my response time is somewhat really horrible, <laughs> as in minutes. And if you fly, that happens <laughs> to everybody occasionally. Um, is it time to get the pilot out of the loop? Ooh. <laughs> uh, so you, what, what you can do is go onto the NTSB website uh, and look at all of these reports on 
They're accidents. 95% human error? Yeah. It's, uh, for the most part, all, uh, yeah. So what is the key, yes? Well, so when you go to automation, uh, there there is the concern that the system may end up in a situation that a human might be able to recover from, but and a pre-programmed automated system might not be able to. Um, so this is still very much an, an active question. And Tim, I'm sure you have some thoughts well, uh, uh, working in this area. I'm going to move that forward. <laughs> uh, what sorts of problems prevent Waymo from going public with a driving car? I, I won't comment on Waymo in public. Sorry. <laughs> All right, fair. I um, love it for my team. I love so, it. So, <laughs> uh, autonomy is fantastic, and we can cover kind of a lot of cases, so like 99% of cases, but it's 1% of cases that are holding everyone back. Um, and that, those 1% of cases aren't just like a nice little, like, here's a box of 1%. It's the, here's the thinly spaced out 1% of all the things that can happen. And so, uh, with autonomous driving, you can have a downed power line, and the car needs to know that that's actually not something I should drive over. Or if there's a squirrel that runs across and it looks like a big object, and it's like, oh, you can, like, you can stop safely or whatever, and it'll, it'll be okay. Um, Let me push on this but, one. So you guys are optimizers, right? Say you want to optimize human life in air travel, and that's your objective. Would you use pilots? Well, we, 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 we just told me that ninety-five percent <laughs> of the accidents are human caused. You're telling me there's still one left. So who's right? So uh, having worked with the FAA for a very long time and have been right. with like a, a very very uh, deep respect for for that so uh, organization, so they're, they're very risk adverse. So do I. And uh, we want our FAA to be risk adverse, right? No, I'm, I'm uh, the, with that. So accidents are, are uh, completely unacceptable. Um, so the, there's there's an area of focus right now in my lab and at Stanford in, in general uh, this past year, uh, together with uh, Doris Sadig and Clark Barrett, uh, we started the Center for AI Safety. And uh, the core mission of that center is how do we make sure that when we automate these systems, all of these, we can have some good feeling that, that uh, we're safe and robust against all of these edge cases. Interesting. But then I would argue if um, pacemakers are automated, elevators are automated, airport trains are automated. So we, we have a lot of stuff that's automated. You must have to be good in our body. That's right. Um, wouldn't you want to see Stanford to be the, the pioneer in just getting rid of pilots? Oh, no, enabling aviation. Um, yes. Let's bring it a little more positively. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I know you're a pilot too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that's exactly what what we're trying to work on uh, increased levels of automation not just for aviation but it, it, it's going to be a key enabler in okay. space exploration and and so forth uh, and so with with aviation the the level of acceptable risk is so minuscule uh, when when there's when there's a mid-air collision or, or a plane accident uh, people the, the public, React right yeah, in, and in ways this year obviously with MCAS, it, exactly. which by the way is a failure of machine human integration. That's right. Yep, that's right. The, there's actually a, a lot of things that we can learn from the MCAS incident. Like what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so a number of things. Uh, the importance of redundant sensors and uh, the importance in. Uh, the processes between uh, industry and the government regulators, um, uh, just robustness to failure, um, the importance of accounting for the human in the loop. And uh, actually, uh, during the long range planning here at Stanford, uh, there, there were a couple major outcomes. One major outcome was the establishment of the Human Centered AI Institute. Uh, which Dorsa is also a part of, um, and uh, understanding the the complexities that arise when you have humans in the system. So humans are a major source of uncertainty in the world, catastrophically in, in long some dimensions uh, uh, as well. Uh, but uh, accounting for that uncertainty when you're trying to optimize your system is actually quite challenging. 
more questions? Is there any correlation between edge uh, cases? Oh, we'll, we'll get your UI microphone. Oh, should I go? Yeah. So this is, I guess, applicable to all three of you. You've together collectively and individually worked on large systems where peak performance is very important, ACAS or flying cars or self-driving cars. And typically, these will have many, many interacting components, some of which are bottlenecks to the full system performance, some of which are not. I guess, are there any general rules of thumb that have proved useful when you're thinking about these very large systems with all these interacting components about what really is the biggest contributor to peak performance because you could you could keep churning out the best up out of every little sub module or you could maybe move to some higher level logic or something like that so i'm wondering if there are any general you know tidbits of wisdom that you have that's one part and the second part is in adopting research based algorithms do you often find that is there a significant difficulty in adopting the algorithm to like real-time system performance because of assumptions or say things that the researchers have thought about or not thought about when they're writing this research that you then have to worry about as an as an engineer as a system adapter so uh, so one of the biggest differences between academia and industry that I've noticed um, is in academia you try to come up with original research that is um, often very specific in a specialization of your field um, in industry, you're solving problems, and some of them are these revolutionary problems like flying cars and autonomous cars. But the ways to solve them are not nearly, usually, of the same level of like out there sophistication. So a lot of stuff that we do has to be extremely understandable by everyone on the team. Uh, there are multiple reasons for that. One is that if it's understandable, it's just going to be more reliable for us. But also, if like my team member leaves. The next person has to understand it. It has to be easy to analyze for those reasons. And so if you have this complicated system that you're trying to make, it's a car, um, or it's going to be a plane, or it's going to be a collision avoidance system, uh, you have this high-level architecture that compartmentalizes things, and it's understandable. You know, OK, the estimator has this job. And then we know if the estimator fails, things downstream of it have to handle that, or we can analyze how those fail because there's a clear, there's a clear job. Um, it's not all spaghetti related. And then once you dig in deeper, like, okay, the estimator algorithm is like a Kalman filter or a particle filter. And then that is like straightforward and easy to understand. And then as an engineer, you can always dig in deeper and you know, okay, like I need to handle these special cases with you know, particle regeneration or something. But there's that, that nested level of uh, organization that makes a huge difference. So, so if I could add a, a few other thoughts to this. Um, there's actually a chapter in the book about multidisciplinary design optimization where you have multiple different components interacting like the part of the, like the state estimator and, and so forth. Uh, when uh, this, this general area of research actually emerged from the aerospace industry where they're trying to build very complicated aircraft systems where you have you know a propulsion system, a control system. Um, you have requirements on, on the structural design and so forth. And you can't just optimize those components in isolation. And so one of the chapters of the book talks about how do you, how do you optimize the end-to-end -end system. Also, uh, to uh, connect with the last uh, part of your question, um, I think what we can do as researchers as much as possible, especially since many of you are PhD students and some undergrads who are getting involved in research, uh, we, we really want to see our research see the light of day and be used by industry. And we can really facilitate that by open sourcing our, our code and just making it publicly available. It requires a little bit of effort beyond just writing the, uh, the paper that gets into a conference. But it will really propel the industry forward if we can share ideas like that. Speaking of that, um, so I was actually just at JuliaCon a few weeks ago. Um, I gave a talk. Uh, the talk was about the textbook. Um, in that case, it wasn't about optimization. It was about how the textbook was written and the technologies used inside of it. And uh, at the end of the talk, we released a repo, open source. Uh, so you can download it, and it contains a template repository for textbook writing. It's called um, Tufty Optimization Book, I think or talk to the algorithms book. Um, and you can use all of the same resources we did 
to compute, uh, like make your own book. And that includes the LaTeX uh, style, but also a bunch of other stuff that goes into how all of the algorithms are typeset, linted, uh, stylized, uh, testing infrastructure we have. All of the code gets executed and compiled to generate the figures. Um, and so you can do all of that uh, yourself if you'd like. It was a huge amount of effort to uh, put together the, the LaTeX class file and, and supporting code. So if, if you're thinking about writing a textbook, um, I would, would recommend taking a look at that. Very, very cool. It's super generous <laughs> of you. Vaughn. Yeah, Vaughn Pratt, uh, Stanford University. Um, so when automating safety critical systems, um, one metric that gets often used is, um, number, is uh, interventions per mile or interventions per minute. Uh, but one also worries about, you know, what fraction of corner cases still remain to be dealt with. Uh, is there any correlation between the two? And uh, does one focus more on one or the other? Great question. So, <laughs> okay, so yeah, so, so managing corner cases is a really big, is a really big deal. So especially, well, I'll actually start with uh, my, my PhD thesis. Um, we're looking at something like having to drive a billion miles in order to, to, to show the safety of a system because you might have a fatality every million miles, right? So you need to go like a factor of maybe like a thousand above that. But even then you have uh, essentially a distribution over the cases you're gonna hit. Every day when I drive, I'm gonna get normal situations and those are all gonna be in the center. But it's the outer periphery in this multidimensional space that's gonna get you. And then, so if I get a billion samples, even the corner cases that I do hit are just gonna be a small fraction of that. Uh, there are different ways to attempt to quantify that. Uh, you're dealing with this multiple dimensional space, so you can't always be sure. But uh, things like surprise rates. So if I if I drive tomorrow in my car a thousand miles and I see nothing, um, that's not yet reason to be sure that the car is safe. But if I'm developing a car and I get accidents every like ten miles, and then the next week um, after fixing things, I now only get accidents every fifty miles that can start to give me like correlation. So if I am hopefully at the point where it's very, very far in between accidents and I'm seeing different ones rather than the same ones, those sorts of uh, decreases in rates can give you more confidence. Uh, yeah, there are other techniques. Yeah, so uh, what one technique that, uh, that we've been working on in the lab starting with uh, Richie Lee's uh, PhD thesis was an automated method to find the most likely failure scenario. So you need a, a measure of likelihood uh, for different trajectories and so forth, but it's really an optimization problem. Maximize likelihood subject to a failure. And uh, we've applied this to the ACAS-X aircraft collision avoidance system, as well as uh, automated driving systems. And knowing the most likely failure condition uh, is extremely useful. So the most likely edge case. Uh, because that can inform some mitigations you, you, in terms of the design. Uh, if you find that the most likely failure condition is so exceptionally rare that you don't have to worry about it, you can have a nice warm feeling in your heart that, that your system has been validated. Okay, okay, to put that into context. So uh, in the lab, uh, this optimization approach tries to find, for example, if you have a car and then you have a pedestrian, we're going to try to find the okay, worst case myself. scenario where we trade off between severity, where the pedestrian gets hurt, or maybe the car gets hurt, and the likelihood. And so we can optimize that for severity, and in that case, the pedestrian runs at the car, and the car can't really do anything, and the pedestrian dies. But if you attach these probability distributions over behavior, you can start to balance the two. Um, and so in this case, maybe the pedestrian steps off right when a sensor goes bad for the autonomous car, because sometimes that happens. And at that point, you get risk, where risk is severity and probability uh, together. And that's usually what you try to minimize because you don't want to get rid of the things that don't happen. You want to handle the cases that happen the most often that are the most severe. Well, it looks like you're going to spend a lot of time on modeling, not just optimization then. Absolutely. So there's a lot of, a lot of that. All right, so any more questions back there? Yeah. Um, so my question is, uh, what role can simulation play in accelerating uh, this validation and safety and design of uh, autonomy at large? That's a great question. So um, uh, one thing I did is I was looking in my thesis at a bunch of driving data. And uh, from that driving data, mostly mostly highway driving data, um, I learned A, how like 
people behave, and I could make models that could then drive cars around the autonomous car in simulation so that they don't drive perfectly. They also make mistakes at somewhat the same frequency that humans do. And so then suddenly you can drive your autonomous car in simulation with these fallible humans and try to cover some of similar. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so different, different sorts of behavior. Um, so that's, that's one thing, is we can get better models from, uh, so we can learn better models so that we can accelerate safety validation that way. You can also do a better analysis of corner cases. So you can start learning in what situations, uh, like what sorts of bad things happen. Uh, of course, you can't cover everything, but again, we're focusing on risk. So the things that are high severe that happen most often. And so um, I came up with methods to, uh, in this case, learn critical situations, learn distributions over them, and then not just replay the same critical situations that have happened in the past, which is still very useful, but uh, sample new ones or new variations of those in order to uh, focus on those critical situations rather than just normal driving, uh, which is pretty safe. See, you're coming to an end slowly. Um, there must be other urgent questions just right from here. Uh, this question is for Tim. Um, I'm wondering, do you often get opportunities to use Julia at your job? And also, um, what's your sense of what it would take, like how far are we from um, companies developing autonomy stacks to begin using Julia more and even preferring it for developing their software? Uh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, no, actually, I, did, didn't you make a commit recently? Uh, I will not comment on Julia. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So um, I, I made uh, I made the first commit uh, that made it into the repo that has Julia uh, for uh, algorithm exploration, um, and then I re-implemented it in C++. But uh, hopefully, uh, why? Uh, well, because we're not running Julia on the vehicle yet. Why not? <laughs> Maybe we will soon. Maybe we will soon. Uh, well, so the honest reason is I'm the only Julia developer at Kitty Hawk right now, as far as I know. <laughs> and in so, a 50 mile radius. <laughs> uh, I mean, Michael is oh, sorry. pretty close. Sorry. 10 mile radius, five miles. <laughs> kidding. So, but uh, the next next generation of engineers. But Kitty Hawk is hiring, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Julia or not, doesn't matter. Julia's getting very serious. Uh, I was just at JuliaCon, and it's I think it's like doubling every year, uh, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, it's a fantastic language to learn how to code in, uh, because not only, especially if you're an engineer, uh, not only do you get all the math and stuff that you get from something like MATLAB, but you also get all the flexibility that you get from Python. Um, yeah. And it is both uh, and expressive my, and fast. My 11-year-old son came to me last week, completely independent, said, Python sucks as all Julia. There you go. That's really true. I'm not making this up. <laughs> so uh, one of the, the big major steps that Julia made, I think, is uh, actually in collaboration with uh, Michael, who worked on the, the collision avoidance system uh, with the MIT Lincoln Lab. And as far as I understand, maybe you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, some of the funding of that work went into features in Julia, such as being able to compile to an executable C binary. And so now you can uh, write Julia code that then can get certified in a very real sense and get used on uh, like something like an aircraft. The official specification that became an international standard in September of 2018 is in Julia. Good, great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's find one closing question. It's almost seven o'clock. Uh, what are your What are your thoughts on uh, building uh, the the distributions that you use to find uh, the faster failures or you know calculate risk? What are your thoughts on sort of having faith in those distributions actually matching? Uh, what people are actually doing, or what the data is actually doing in, in real life? Uh, that's a fantastic question. Okay, so uh, kind of to summarize it is, I've taken I've taken data from maybe this highway driving set, and if I learn some models of it, and now I like go and say, okay, I've driven in simulation, now the car is safe. I don't know if the car is like actually safe. Um, and uh, the answer is is that the the level at which it was applied in my thesis is not going to be sufficient um, for sure. Like, it took maybe like four hours or whatever it is, like 60, it was even like 16 hours of driving data in aggregate. Like that's not going to be enough to cover everything. Uh, that being said, very real efforts into collecting data every day on highways could start to actually build up a repertoire. If you have millions of miles of real world streets in Mountain View, you can at least convince yourself that like Mountain View is safe. Um, and so I think, I think these things definitely have, uh, are, are useful and can be used. Um, the level at which grad students apply them, maybe not, but I think as a technique, it's, it's fairly simple.
And if you're interested in learning more about how to build good statistical models, uh, there's this excellent textbook by Rob Tipsharani and Trevor Hasty on the elements the of statistical ethics. learning. And they're right there. <laughs> right. right. right there. Well, I want to thank Stephen for organizing this uh, and running the center and inviting us all over. Yeah. And I want to see if a few times, even if you don't buy the book, take a look inside. It's actually the textbook you always wanted, like not just <laughs> abstract descriptions and lots of references, but practical descriptions, algorithms that you can implement, view graphs that explain things. And after reading this book, and I'm not kidding, I don't think there will ever be another book we've written optimization because it will be very hard to compete with this book. Congratulations to both of you, and I uh, can't wait for the next book. <laughs>